Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. I would like to talk with you today about uh, how the container or Docker revolutionized the DevOps IT landscape. And my talk will not be necessarily very technically. I mean, it will be about Docker, it will be technically, but without code examples, because I want to show you or explain you more the, the principles, the core concepts behind Docker, and also the results of these concepts that will change your uh, daily work if, you, if you're working with Docker. Um, before we start, let me introduce myself. My name is Vadim. I uh, work for the company called 8Gears, and if you would like to find more about me, you can best is to follow me on GitHub and or on Twitter. Then you can see my repositories and then see what I'm doing and which repositories I'm start, starring. Uh, I'm working for the company 8Gears, and we're actually developing software. And this also today involves developing um, cloud infrastructures, because developing software and developing infrastructures are actually the same. It's both software. On one hand, it's software that produces a code, produces a website, an application. On one hand, you develop software that produces an infrastructure, which is also actually the same. You have to test it, you have to have a quality assurance, you have to have a repository, you have the continuous integration, continuous delivery, and all that stuff, uh, sort of stuff. Then we also do some workshops in, in the area of Docker containerization and also in Kubernetes, the clustering infrastructure. But let's dive into Docker. Whom of you know what Docker is? Who of you used already Docker? What of you already? So, but nevertheless, so what is the idea behind Docker? So the principal idea behind Docker is to have an application which is isolated, complete, that runs everywhere. Isolated means that there are no conflicts or whatever to other libraries that are on the system. So there is no conflicts, there are no dependencies to other libraries that are uh, on your system, so you know exactly what you're running. Complete means that the application that you're running brings everything with it that it needs. So everything that the application needs is part of uh, the package. So, and running everywhere means that the result or the container is really running everywhere. I mean, everywhere means in, on Linux, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> the other, everything else doesn't matter. No, seriously. Uh, so it means that it runs everywhere and, 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 I mean, now it's basically on Linux. So it runs on every Linux system that has some certain kernel parameters that are right. Uh, but also it's running on, on Windows since a couple of weeks and months. Windows supporting uh, Docker already, so you can really run native Windows applications on on a, on a Windows kernel. So, and there will be probably one day there will be also something for the Mac. But um, but why is Docker so popular? I mean, Docker is two years old, you know. And why is it so popular? I mean, we we had uh, Zolar zones, or it's called even Zolar containers, that exist since 2005. And are very successful, and 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 people on the Solar, uh, Solaris uh, systems uh, use it. We have uh, FreeBSD jails that exist since the year 2000 already. So it, we have these container concepts uh, in in the history of of, of uh, Unixes all the time. So why is is, is Docker so successful in the, in recent years? And it's actually the focus of Docker specifically to be user friendly, to be easy to use specifically for developers, and also with its functionality to be very easy extendable. So you can really easy extend Docker and put new stuff in, and you can extend it with new functionality very, very easy, much, much easier than the other solutions. To better understand this advantage, let's take a look uh, on how Docker is, is conceptualized. You know, from the object-oriented software development from the object-oriented languages, that there is something like an object and a class, and an object is nothing more than an instance of a class. So the same you can think of, of images and containers in a Docker environment. You have an image which is, represents a class, and if you instantiate it, you make it run, it becomes 
a container because it's, it's the actual instance running. So a container is a why uh, use specific my uh, use specific block, for example, or uh, yeah, so different inst instances of of this image. So, but each image itself contains of multiple layers. On those layers can be stacked together on each other, on top of each other. So actually, if you if we take a look at WordPress image, it's not just the WordPress image itself. It contains uh, underneath it contains P a PHP layer that provides your PHP uh, runtime environment, and underneath it it contains an uh, um, stripped down Linux operating system. In this case, it will be Unix or sorry Ubuntu, and so this is how you actually build your applications. It's like a lay, layer by layer or images that extend other images. And you can create yeah, more and more complicated solutions. Um, so when we talk about Docker, we actually mean various different things. So we not we actually mean things like the Docker daemon, which is responsible for starting the containers stopping the containers and running the containers, but also is responsible to get the images, to build the images. And we talk about Docker, uh, and we mean the client, the, the command line client, uh, that is communicating with the daemon and is responsible to trigger the daemon to, to tell it, okay, start, start a container and stop a container and create a network or whatever. And we have also the, the registry, which is not part of, of Docker itself, but it's very uh, tightly coupled to Docker because it provides a repository where the images that I create or someone else creates, I can take and reuse for my purposes. And then next to the Docker functionality, we have the, the, the common extensions. Most of them, are, are these this examples here are provided by, by Docker Incorporated itself, but they are very closely coupled to Docker, and we are talking about uh, Compose, Docker Compose, which is a, allows you to create an application uh, that is consists of multiple containers. So you can have a compo compose multiple containers together to run them as a whole. And we have a machine, Docker machine, that facilitates to create or to provision servers. So you can kind of use machine to a provision server where Docker will be installed and it's configured so you can communicate easily with it. And Swarm is actually responsible for if you have a multiple Docker hosts, um, so they can kind of communicate with each other. So you can create a cluster of multiple Docker instances. And this is for this you normally use Swarm to use this. So, but one of the main reason why Docker is so successful is that the ecosystem around Docker is providing hundreds and thousands of extensions or product that are specifically made for Docker that extend the functionality of Docker and provide new functionality that would really um, limit Docker just on itself. Um, let's look of um, a group of those tools that exist in the ecosystem. So we, we need to, to better understand them. We need to group them into, into categories. And we have a category of tools which, is, uh, which are responsible for orchestration. Orchestration means if I have multiple containers, or no, sorry, sorry, not containers. If I have multiple hosts, a cloud environment, like I have 100 machines, and I want to deploy on those 100 machines containers very easily, those 100 machines need to communicate in some way. In the, so I create a kind of a clustering. I need to orchestrate my containers. I need to orchestrate uh, where the container is executed, actually. And so there are tools like Kubernetes, like Mesos, like Swarm, and or Rancher that help or facilitate the, the orchestration of, of containers across multiple hosts, multiple environments. And then we have tools that are responsible for monitoring your containers and logging. So that you always know, no matter where your container is running, that it's correctly, uh, the data is locked correctly, and that the state of the container is monitored. And then there's tools that are responsible for discovery. And discovery is needed if you have an a environment where you have like 100 containers, microservices, running and working together. 
those containers need to communicate to each other. Those containers need to find each other. Because you cannot just uh, run a container on one node and run on, on container on, on the other node uh, and expect that they find each other and they can communicate with each other. So you need tools that facilitate you with this. And uh, example of those tools are, for example, Honzu, ETCD, uh, Zookeeper, Netflix, Eureka, that help you to, uh, uh, to achieve this goal very easily in context of Docker. And then you have also tools that are, of course, create this virtual network. So you have a network inside a network, so your containers can communicate with each other like it was a, a virtual kind of a virtual network. And there's also plenty of tools in this area. And so let's look before we go to the next slide. Let's look on the on the um, on the architecture of, of, of Docker. So we have here um, our an architecture of, uh, of Docker. So we have underneath we have the hardware, and then we have some Linux stuff going on here. So there's like the Linux kernel functionalities, uh, like namespaces, C groups. So there's really something deep inside inside Linux. And then on on each on the Linux system we have the container running. And as I told you, that the container is everything that needs to run. It contains all those Linux libraries that are needed for your application to run, like the JVM, like Node.js, like Ruby libraries. Everything is there in the container. And the daemon, or actually I call it, uh, I wrote it Docker, but it's actually the daemon. The daemon is not in the container. It's just communicating. It's not communicating with the container itself, or not directly. It's, it's starting these containers. It's managing those containers. It sees if they were running, and it stops them. And so it's kind of a sits aside of the container. It's not part of it. And so this, this allows uh, some third party to, communi to communicate with the daemon that, that will then start and stop the containers. And one thing to note is that the, actually the container are all running on the one on the same kernel. So you don't have a, a multiple kernels here. You have one hardware, one Linux kernel, and all those containers are running on one kernel. And this has an a very um, big impact on performance, a positive impact in this case, because everything is running on a, on a one single kernel, isolated from each other. It takes zero overhead regarding uh, to start the container. So it doesn't matter if you start your MySQL or, or PHP application without containers or with containers. It's zero overhead, because it's actually this, the same kernel and the same workflow here. and the second part is um, because it's it's isolated, and not sorry, not isolated because it's running on the kernel. The resource overhead is zero. So, like uh, like on virtual machines where you have an operating system, an operating system, an operating system on one hardware where it consumes and 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 eats your resources. Here you have absolutely no resource overhead, so it does not consume more resources than a single process. So let's take a look why this, this, this Docker architecture is, is such a revolution or such a big change in, in how uh, you develop your applications. So before we dive into this, there are some things that really um, kind of a Docker narrows down or, or restricts you in using. So there is a case where where um, Docker is ideal for. And this is the case where you have a um, stateless container. So the requirement for Docker is that the container is stateless. So it doesn't have any state. Or you create a container that has an external state. So you can have a container that's connected to a database where the state is inside. But your application itself is, is stateless. So we're talking here about, I don't know if, if you know the 12-factor applications, 12-factor apps. Does it ring a bell? So you should Google it, 12-factor apps. It's, it's, a, it's a design principle, how you develop applications that are stateless. And because this restriction is, in many cases, um, yeah, for, for a lot of people, this is, uh, how do you say, mm, at the beginning, it's very problematic. It's very difficult to design an application, especially if you have an existing application. It's very, very difficult to migrate or to move it into a stateless one. Because you have a lot of overhead, you have a lot of 
things already in your application, and it's very difficult to, uh, to to migrate to make it stateless. In many cases, not all, but it's normally it's it's it's, it's a problem. And um, this this um, restriction has, on the other hand, a huge, huge advantage. And the huge advantage is that you have this so-called atomic throwaway containers. So you have a, a container that's actually a throwaway container. So this means that you start the container, and if you want to stop it, you don't care. You just stop it, you remove it, and it's gone. So there is no old libraries left anymore. So there's nothing on your host operating system that uh, may be leftovers, and next time you start, it does not work anymore. And if you update the next version, it doesn't work anymore. So this is uh, not a problem anymore. There's really no leftovers. And because it has no state, you can just stop it. You don't have to worry. And because it has no state, you just can start it. And because it has no state, you can start it once, twice, three times. You can run it on one data center. You can run it on two data centers. You can run it all over the globe. Because it has no state, it's easy to scale up. This is a huge advantage if you want to have an application that's not only uh, scalable, so it you know, can cope with millions of users, but also uh, it results in an application that's really resilient. This means you can start it, and if it stops, you start it again, or you start it on a new uh, server, which is uh, reliable. So it really improves the re re resilience of your application. Or it, uh, and this is, of course, the result of the immutable container. So we call it uh, the throwaway container. We call it immutable because it has no state. And so this. So if we take a look, or if you if you if you using Docker for a while, you know, then you will uh, ask yourself maybe, you know, how does Docker actually compare to other technologies? You know, how does it compare to VMware? Because it's some sort of virtualization, you know. But how does it really compare to VMware? And how does it maybe compare to Ansible? Because you, could, you can do some configuration with it. And if you if you if you Google. Uh, like Docker versus something on the internet, you will find many articles and many results how uh, Docker is compared to all those technologies. But if you take a bit of closer look on the slide, you will maybe see, if you know these technologies, you will maybe see that there are uh, three groups of technologies we're talking about. So we have virtualization technology like VMware, uh, like SAN, KVM. So this is the virtualization technology. We have Configuration management tools, you know, like uh, Ansible, like SoulStack, Chief, Capistrano. Those are configuration tools. And also we have some tools like OpenStack and Mesos that are more for orchestration. And you see that actually Docker is some, somewhere in between. So it, it really compares to things like VMware and also to uh, Ansible. So that compares to, uh, to, to many different things. So, so the result is actually that. The Docker orientation is not very focusing on, on, on replacing technology, but it's a very uh, broadly range, not very deeply itself, but very broadly across multiple technologies. Because it covers something from configuration management, it covers something from virtualization. It's not good in virtualization comparing to VMware or something, because VM has really, really great functionality regarding virtualization. But it has something, the core functionality of it is there. And those many factors of, of Docker, because it spans over this much technologies, allows a completely different way of how people can work and collaborate together. Collaborate together. Because this wide orientation, there are new workflows possible that are not possible otherwise. And I mean, Workflows for, for developers, for operations teams, for system administrators, for, for, for QAs that um, would not be possible otherwise. So before we answer the question, so what kind of workflows? Let us see what a typical workflow today would be without um, having Docker. So in a classical software de deployment, a software development world, we have this kind of a workflow. So let me explain. We have two teams here that are responsible for uh, 
let's say, developing and deploying application into production, making available for, for the customers to, to visit the website, for example. So we have, on one hand, we have developers and say, okay, I have an application, I want to have it running somewhere. And have the, the ops people on the other side, the system administrator, that are responsible for providing you the infrastructure uh, so your application can run. And so you, you make a request, okay, I need hardware, I need a machine that has 30, uh, 30, 32 gigabytes of RAM, I have mach need a machine that has two uh, SSD drives with uh, this IOPS I rate and stuff like this, and then you'll get the machine. And one day, then you start configuring it, because maybe it is already configured, but anyway, e even if it's configured, you still need to do a configuration because you need to adapt the machine for your specific purposes. You need to install software, you need to configure it, and then you say, okay, I configured everything, and then there's someone from the DevOps team or our operations team looking at it and say, mm, no, this is not allowed in our organization. And then you start, you start tweaking around. So you start tweaking around and say, okay, what is allowed? How can I work around? And if it's a large, larger organization, it's, it's very restricted because you cannot install this, you, can, you have to use only this operating system because those people want to have also an easy life, you know? They, want, they don't want to support like 25 different operating systems. They want to have one operating system, Ubuntu or uh, CentOS or Debian, they don't want to like 25 different because you know uh, Debian, it's easier for you, but for them, it's easier to maintain one operating system. It's easier for them to maintain only one set of libraries, you know? It's easier for them to manage one JVM instead of 20. So, and then it's, it's starting triggering, and it, it goes on and on and on until one day everyone is happy and your application is finally running, and then the process is done. And this is a very cumbersome uh, approach because it takes a long time. It's, it's very hard to establish a workflow inside an organization where different teams collaborate with each other on a topic they're not very familiar with because the developers are not very familiar about the infrastructure because they know that something like this exists, but they don't know exactly what it is and how to cope with this. On the other hand, the operations people, they don't know the application, they don't know what is inside and how it, how it should run. And with the Docker approach or the container approach, it's, it's very easy. You, know? you have the developer that creates his application, you have the developer that creates a container where his application is running, he tests it, he verifies it, he makes sure that his application is running in this container and is running in this container successfully. After that, he just hands over the container to the ops people or the operations people and say, look, this container is running, I give it to you, make it run for me. And the operations team just configures everything around it, the parameters around it, and can easily run the application. Because it doesn't have to know what is actually inside. It just has to know how to start the container. It doesn't have to know how to start the application, how to connect it to a database, how to do this, how to do that. So it's really application-specific stuff. It doesn't have to know it. It just has to know how have I, should I configure my environment to make this uh, container run. And because, because of this, this workflow, we can say that Docker is creating a standardized interface, not only for the operating system and the container to communicate with each other, but it creates also a standardized interface between uh, developers on one hand and the operations people on the other hand. How they communicate, because if they communicate with each other, they have clear interfaces and in how they communicate, because they're always communicating around the functionality that Docker provides and there is no mismatch. And this is called the segregation of duties. So we have a really strict segregation be between the developers and the operations. And let's see it from a different perspective uh, on this topic. So um, we have here a classical layout of a, of a infrastructure. On the left-hand side, we see uh, the classical view, so we have a infrastructure, hardware, we have an operating system, we have a hypervisor, and in the, on each hypervisor, we have a virtual machine running, VMware or whatever, and inside this VMware, we have an operating system, and this operating system contains some libraries, and then we have this application, and this is the same, this is the same, so we have actually one, two, three, 
for operating system that has to be managed. On the other hand, we have this, this Docker setup. We have here an infrastructure. We have an operating system. We have here the Docker engine. And on top of this, we have the containers, which actually lack an operating system because it's uh, the Docker engine takes care of it. And this is kind of a leaner approach. And and this, this interfaces come into place because this and this are the domain of the operations people. This is the, the domain where the operations people operate. They create infrastructure, they maintain the infrastructure, they make sure that those things run. Uh, here it's, it's this part and here it's, it's a bit less. And this is the ops domain. And on the other hand, we have here the developer domain. And here, the developer domain. You see, the developer domain and the ops domain are completely separated. Because here, in the classical world, you as a developer, you have, to, you have to know what is actually running on the operating system that is not under your control. You maybe have access to it, but you have not control over it. At least in, in, in larger organizations, we have, we have two teams. And this results in conflicts. This is the area where you have to communicate with the other side without clear language and clear interfaces. You have to communicate here with the, the dev and, and the, op the operations on, on the same stuff without having clear interfaces. And the, the ops have a different view on this than the developers, and this is normal. And here, it's very clear, uh, there's a clear separation between them two. So, Finally, we can say that if we talk about containers, we can say uh, that the developers are responsible for making the container run. They're responsible for making the application in the container run mode, and the operations people are responsible for actually making the container run somewhere. So this is a, the, the final thought about this. So. If we're talking about the segregation of duties between the devs and the ops, does it still need something like DevOps? I mean, this is a really hyped word, you know? And everyone is talking about DevOps, and I'm telling you that we don't need it anymore. Or I'm not telling you, but I'm asking the question, do we need it anymore? But you know, before we dive into this, this DevOps buzzword topic, let's find out, you know, what does this DevOps stuff mean, you know? If we talk about DevOps and its definition, there are different things meant by this. You know, DevOps or devs doing ops stuff, this is actually what your, your company thinks your DevOps means, you know? <laughs> because they think, okay, we don't need ops, we have DevOps, they do everything. This is what, but this is not quite true, you know? But and then the second definition of DevOps is actually that it means that. Uh, you're developing, or someone or s somewhere is developing the infrastructure just like it's normal application, just as normal code. It has a, it has a build system, it has a uh, UA system, it has a continuous integration, it has continuous delivery. It's just nothing more than a normal application. And you have to develop it just a normal application. And this results that uh, you're in a DevOps you use actually the same tools as a developer. You have an IDE, you have uh, uh, continuous tests and everything like this. And the th third definition, which is actually not a definition on the technology, but it's a definition on that DevOps means that developers and operations team are closely collaborating together as one team and not as a separate team. So there's actually, you can say it not as one person, but as one pe team that uh, works closely together so developers learn from the ops what are they doing and know what are they doing in their domain and on the other hand as well that ops know what the developers are doing. Because they are operating actually in the same domain now, they are not operating in separate, separate domains, they are together. We can, we can assume that the, the devs and the ops use the same tools to, to get work done. And because they're using the same tools, everyone from each side knows how to use those tools. And this is, for example, Docker is such a tool because it's used, on one hand, it's used by the, by the ops people. On the other hand, it's used also by the dev people. 
And to, to highlight this example, let's take a look at the, at the, at the Docker runtime environment. So we have here a runtime environment. Uh, it's, it's called the Docker aware container environment. So where we have a container that actually knows that it's running in a, that it's a container, it knows that it's running on the Docker daemon because it, and can, it can communicate with the Docker engine or the Docker daemon. And this is a, a great example for this, for devs and ops using the same tools because this is our application. It is responsible or it is maintained and developed by the developers because it contains your business data and business logic. And this is your business application that's developed. And these are containers that are actually developed by the ops people. And those containers are responsible for security, maybe securing the application or securing the whole infrastructure. We don't know. But they use the same tools to achieve this goal. They use uh, logging to achieve the same goals because they're using, they're using containers that are aware of, of, of Docker and that can maybe lock your application without you even knowing it. So the, you actually have uh, tools, one tool that you use uh, from both sides in a, in a different context, in a, in a different manner. And these standardized interfaces can not only be used from, from devs and ops, but also in, within the containers together. So the containers can communicate with each other and use information from one container in the other container without having interfaces or without, without, uh, having, without being tightly coupled to each other. So we have something like logging. We can provide very, very easily logging for a container that is running somewhere on a server that aggregates everything, it makes a really pretty logs across your whole infrastructure without the application or without the container even noticing that it's log being locked. And the same goes for archiving. We don't have to implement some, some archiving functionality in our application. We just know because it has some interfaces and Docker how to archive Docker containers, someone will do it for us and the application doesn't have to care about this. And this goes on for security, for orchestrating multiple containers. This is how, what are the tools are for there uh, to orchestrate multiple containers. And the containers don't know about it. They just know that they, they don't even know that they're containers. They think they're running in, in their own operating system. And you can, yeah, this list goes in all, on and on. So, as a summary, we can say that even though Docker is a very, very popular tool, tool in the recent, recent years, on, um, there's one yeah, difficulty, actually. It's that Docker is often used more by developers than by operations. And it has some reasons for that. Um, because one of the reasons is that um, operations people are used to, to use their tools. They know their, their bash shells, they know their shells, they know very precisely how to configure Linux. They know all these nifty details of a Linux kernel. They know everything. And now with Docker, they have a, a big limitation in, the, in, this, in this flexibility. flexibility, And they have to, to learn new tools. They have to learn uh, to use new, new functionality. And this means that um, the operations people need to, to change how they're working. And a lot of those people don't like change. I mean, a lot of Actually, all of, all of us don't like changes if it's, if it's too much. Um, then you have no control over the container. So if someone is building a container, if it's you, then you have control of your container. But someone else, the operations, don't have a control of it. They don't know what is inside. And for, for many people, this is a, a big problem because if they don't know what's inside, how can they operate it? How can they make it run? So this is a... Mm, yeah, this is a, for, for a lot of the operations environments, it's, it's a problem, uh, or many people have a problem with that. So, so as a conclusion, we can say that the containers provide a better separation of responsibilities between the operations and the developers, and that we have, a, we have to take care that our container that we create are stateless, because if they're not stateless, we can, we, can, we can make them run, but they will not run efficiently or the, they will have problems with running. And 
we have the possibility that Docker on itself is, um, is just an application virtualization. So we're virtualizing our application, nothing more, with some tools around it. But in principle, it's, it's, it's a very limited functionality. It's, it's widely spread, but it's limited. And if we want to use Docker efficiently, we have to rely on third-party applications and third-party tools and make use of them to create better applications, especially if we are uh, moving into a microservice architecture where we, where we have multiple containers communicating with each other over multiple hosts. Then the drawback is that we have to learn new tools. I mean, we as the developer have, have to learn Docker and all those Docker-specific tools. And of course, the operations people need to, uh, to learn those tools. Um, on the other hand, the I mean, Docker is, I think, a few years old, like two years or something. Huh? It's, it's, it's very, the, the first release was two years ago, or two and a half years. So I think the, the first public release of Docker was 2013. The first uh, 1.0 release was 2014 or something, I'm not sure. Huh? But only a few years. And we have a thousand, hundreds and thousands of, of technologies around Docker um, how you can extend Docker and how you need to extend Docker to use it efficiently. And this is sometimes very, very confusing and very difficult to pick the right tool. I mean, it's difficult to find the right tool. And then if you find a few ones, it's very difficult to pick the right tool for your specific use case because all those tools that exist, uh, exist for, for, for a reason because they are different. And it's, it's sometimes it's very difficult to pick a, a, a tool and also to stick with it because you know, a lot of those tools are going extinct in a, in month, a years, and uh, you don't want to you know bet on a, on a wrong horse. And last but not least, there is the still a, not yeah some kind of a problem is that a lot of software vendors do not provide container yet. I mean there is something like uh, official containers in the in the Docker registry, which are called official, but I mean they're not really official. They are just officially managed by Docker Incorporated, but those are not official containers by the companies who create the software, you know? And often we have software in Docker registry which is open source because you can download it, you can start it. There is not, there are not many property software. I mean, there is no Oracle database in, 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 in Docker registry and there are not so many uh, commercially not open source software uh, on, on, on the registry, not yet at least. And so this is a bit of a, a problem for, for at least large corporations, large organizations to adopt Docker because they fear that there might be um, uh, some problems here. And that's it from my talk. I hope you have a good insight about the, the consequences of Docker and how it will change your life or the life if, if you're working with it and how it's um, changing the, the workflow in an organization. Thank you very much.